In a matter of weeks, the opulent, luxurious cruise ship vacation has been reduced to a floating petri dish. Something that people like to refer to cruises oftentimes before this moment, and particularly now. I guess some stereotypes exist for a reason. But a few things happened recently in the cruise ship industry that I really wanted to get into. This video will cover three things. Boats, bookings, bailouts. Which is bonkers. It seems like the cruise vacation is a very popular way to travel now, particularly if you're amongst an older age demographic. So a lot of retirees or uh, people over the age of 50 and 60 that I speak with just immediately out of the gate talk about the latest cruise that they went on or this uh, Mediterranean experience and how the cruise is just a great way to see the world. On the face of it, it's kind of easy to see the appeal. So there's a lot of rooms, a lot of services. On the top of the video I mentioned that they were these luxury, or they are these luxury experiences, and they almost have these little theme parks, water parks, they've got these large decks that pretty much act like a beach, there are people giving you all sorts of rainbow colored fruity beverages um, of the alcoholic variety of course and there's on crew or on ship entertainment like live musical acts and mediocre comedians looking at the cruise line industry today it's hard to imagine it with more humble origins i mean you look at these massive ships and the length of some of them are just longer than five or six blue whales uh, some people did that scaling and it, it's pretty bonkers but there was actually a time when these cruise ships were just ocean liners and they were only for the super rich the cruise line industry started around 1844 with these private ocean liners that took people from chartered location to chartered location with a luxurious room and a very almost private experience. By the late 1800s and early 1900s, this cruise line industry actually grew in scale and it seemed like there were different companies competing to have the largest boat with the most amount of accommodations and services. So you kind of see these ships like the Titanic is a notable example, which bragged about how nothing could sink it and it could accommodate over 3,000 passengers and crew members and had the most state-of-the-art smoking rooms, diners, uh, or like dining areas, and just these lounge areas. I mean, only if you were affluent, and it, the experience probably would have been nice if you discount the what happened at the end there. It wasn't until like the 1980s where we saw a more commercialized experience of the cruise ship industry. So we see more rooms, more services, more entertainment uh, offerings, and um, like I mentioned at the top of the video, this is more when we see the has-been musical acts and mediocre comedians that we all enjoy today, and it became less about the super rich and more of an accessible experience for more common travelers. And looking at the industry today, we see three dominating companies. We see Carnival Cruise Lines, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian Cruise Lines. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, and these three main operators that I described have, income, have an income that is well into the millions. And in Canada, this industry was not insignificant. It had over 2 million arrivals uh, with passengers going on these cruises, which contributed $3.2 billion to the industry and employed 23,000 people countrywide. And things were looking pretty great for the cruise ship industry in both Canada and the US. Each year, they were actually breaking their own records, which is pretty rad and they probably would have kept on going on that upward trajectory but then by 2020 they hit some choppy waters The Cruise Lines International Association expected 32 million people to set sail and enjoy the cruise ship industry this year. But what they didn't count on was a global pandemic that would have put all international travel to a standstill. To be fair, obviously nobody anticipated this pandemic and it uh, struck anybody in the travel industry particularly hard. 
This would have more devastating effects for the cruises that were already out at sea as no country or no port wanted to accept them for risk of actually getting infected by COVID-19. Having that aforementioned moniker of a floating petri dish really didn't help matters. At the beginning of May, Global Affairs said that there were still about 122 US ships and 98 Canadian ships still stuck at sea looking for somewhere to land. This left thousands of people, both passengers and crew members, left in a lurch and very afraid of their own health and safety. People who had booked their trips but had not set sail yet were scrambling to cancel their trips and get a refund as soon as possible. To the cruise industry's credit, they did offer refunds and uh, try to work with the passengers, mostly in the form of uh, vouchers for future travel because they're trying to keep the revenue still. Understandably, a mass wave of refunds probably would have sunk the industry, but um, there were some companies who offered refunds, some who didn't. Economically, this led to a lot of problems, obviously, for the Canadians working in the cruise line industry, but this also had some dire impacts for the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board. They were looking at a loss of about $1 billion after, near the beginning of the year, they tripled their investments to Royal Caribbean Cruise. More specifically, BC's tourism industry was also at, is also at risk. So their Alaska itinerary would actually generate $2.2 billion for the province. It's no surprise that the longer that operations are suspended, the more deep, the deeper and more longer lasting these impacts will be. So these companies are trying to set sail as soon as possible, safely, but also very rapidly. Or about as safely as you could resume operations on a cruise line during a pandemic where people are just elbow to elbow when they're not huddled in their rooms. Carnival Cruise was the first out of the gate, announcing that it would resume some of its operations by August 1st, and expected full operations to occur on July 31st. So the three major operators were very quick to announce their intentions to resume operations near the middle and end of the summer. Now, the cruise ship industry is going to face a lot of challenges in the near future, but apparently demand isn't one of them. According to cruise planners, bookings jumped 600% this month compared to this same time last year. Now this might not seem like anything because it's a percentage comparison between nominal figures that we don't actually know, but in my case I was just stunned to see that people were rushing to get onto these, as we call it, floating petri dishes during a pandemic as soon as possible. Now I know that uh, a lot of these cruise lines are offering discounted rooms, some as low as $28 a night, but I mean, yeah, bargain bin vacation or your own health. Now the Times did some of its own reporting on this, looking at Swiss Bank UBI's data, and they saw that bookings this month made for uh, 2021 were actually up 9% compared to the same time last year. So. Demand is not only seemingly consistent, it's actually kind of growing in a weird way. And these weren't just people making up for cruises that were cancelled, these were apparently new and unique bookings that hadn't existed prior to the pandemic. People, I guess, are just trying to take advantage of deep discounts. When I kind of brought this up on Twitter, there was a mix of reactions. Some people going on about how idiotic these travelers were, and then some people are saying, well hey, a good deal is a good deal. And I know I keep bringing up this name a lot, but uh, cruise ships are called floating petri dishes for a pretty good reason. That's because if a virus outbreak happens on a cruise ship, it's damn near impossible to actually contain it. Especially when you're dealing with a virus during a pandemic where asymptomatic people can carry it without anybody really being any the wiser. Despite their best efforts, the Diamond Princess ship saw 700 infections and they were docked at a port with quarantine measures in place. Despite the many headlines of these agonizing cruise ship experiences during the pandemic, it didn't really dissuade people from booking. Despite the anticipated demand, the industry is still very much taking a huge hit because of the pandemic. So much so that people are actually bouncing around the idea of a bailout. Some people are strongly in favor of a bailout for the cruise line industry, saying that it is a major employer across North America, 
In part one, we talked about how it employed thousands of Canadians, so I do see that side of the argument to a degree. The other half of the equation is saying, sure, cruises, we'll give you a bailout. Just as soon as you stop that tax avoidance nonsense. That's right, despite being headquartered in Florida, our major operators actually have registered tax havens in other countries. Other people arguing against a bailout quickly point out to the severe, severe environmental impacts that the industry has had on the world. One company was actually very recently had pled guilty to violating environmental laws in the US. Quick Google search of cruise industry bailout will quickly yield results saying either why it shouldn't be bailed out or just an article that's kind of in the middle of the road assessing whether or not it should be bailed out. There are very few publications or people speaking very publicly about really being in favor of bailing it out at this point. The only person I can think of offhand that uh, outside of the cruise ship industry that has very much spoken in favor of bailing out the cruise industry was Donald Trump. And people are appealing back and forth in the US whether or not it should or shouldn't be bailed out. People bring up the tax avoidance issue in the US. In Canada, there haven't been these many talks and it doesn't seem like the federal government has really committed to whether or not they did want to offer the industry such a bailout package. Let's look at this debate from a very basic economic context. The success of an industry is pretty sink or swim, and if that industry is not vital to a nation from an employment prospect or just its contribution to the GDP, then it's pretty much rational to leave it to its fate if it's experiencing a severe downturn. Granted, you could argue that the cruise industry was absolutely crushing it before COVID-19 became a problem, and any stimulus package that they would need would just get them over this hump so that they can be rocking and rolling again. And the economic data put out there seems to suggest that it is doing well, but some critics say that this economic data, which has been provided by cruise industry associations and is, in, I suppose, inherently biased, has been ballooned and exaggerated. So it's quite possible, unfortunately, that the data and facts that I posted near the beginning of this video are a little bit misleading, but it's kind of the only data that's out there. In this debate, I'm leaning towards not giving the industry a bailout because I think there are smaller businesses that would benefit more from a stimulus package instead. And with the cruise industry, if it's as big and amazing as it says it is, it should be able to shoulder a downturn, especially if it's not paying tax. That weighs my decision uh, further towards not giving it a bailout. Going back to the smaller businesses, I think it's more important to give them the stimulus package because it would give them the fiscal power to get over this hump and obviously we don't know what the economy or the world will look like on the other end of this so which isn't to say that we know if this is going to be a temporary downturn for the small businesses or if this is going to be a long wave but for the cruise ship industry it seems like they could do just fine using the their own revenues and laurels there i understand the debate is very complex and nuanced but if you're a company avoiding taxes and you're asking for a government to help balloon you with taxpayer funded stimulus, yeah, that's a losing battle. But one thing I don't understand, who is going on these cruises? I don't get it at all. I, I just don't, I honestly don't see the appeal of cruises and I, I went to Twitter kind of mentioning this and people are just like, oh Stephanie, you don't understand. I love being surrounded by sunburnt retirees who are drunkenly talking about their other vacation experiences. You're missing out. Maybe, probably not though. i will rather just go to a country boots on the ground experience. It's, it's a lot better in my opinion. Ah, Jesus H. Okay, so in the comments, just tell me why I'm wrong about cruises. If it's an Alaskan cruise or some sort of northern area cruise where walking around would be less feasible, okay, fine, I get it. That sounds kind of nice, but if it's like a Mediterranean experience, how about I just go to a Mediterranean country and then just kind of wander the streets there instead of being on a boat with a bunch of people who are just <laughs> kind of like going on about their own shallow experiences of vacationing. I, I can't see the cruise as being a very in-depth way to experience a culture abroad. I'm sorry. Anyway, whatever. Um, thanks for watching this video. I appreciate that. I don't care about cruises, but I care about you guys. So 
Like, comment, subscribe, go to stephaniehughesjournalism.com and read about other articles I wrote. Not, not many of which have much to do with the cruise industry, but uh, there should be something there that will catch your attention. So I'll catch you next time. This is Stephanie Hughes, signing off.